When we left off class the other day, we had been devouring this fascinating article uh, regarding the multifaceted roles of fatty acid synthesis in cancer. And we had spent already a little bit of time reading. You had read ahead of time and then together as a class, we had read through um, a portion of this page here, page 733, and we had been able to synthesize, <laughs> we had synthesized the synthesis of fat. We had thought about how uh, fatty acids are made. But then we had zoned in on a particular passage here about upstream regulators of fatty acid biosynthesis. So we were devouring this passage, expression, expression of the enzymes involved in fatty acid biosynthesis is controlled by sterile regulatory element binding proteins, or SREBPs. So this is a family of three basic helix loop helix leucine zipper proteins. And that probably makes quite a bit of sense to you. You, you remember back to the motifs and this idea of helix loop helix, um, and even probably remember the leucine zipper proteins. But what you might not recognize is this notion of tra transcription factors. You might even be saying, what's transcription? And we, we got to that a little bit last time. Um, you may also be thinking, well, SR EBPs bind to sterile regulatory elements, or SREs, and some EBOX sequences in the promoters of their target genes. Whew, there's a lot of words there. So what is a promoter? Um, what is an EBOX sequence? And what are these regulatory regions within a promoter? And these are questions we need to take on. Um, additionally, these target genes also encode for enzymes um, of that encode for enzymes of the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. So said another way, these SREBPs bind to and control the expression of, um, of those genes that are involved in fatty acid biosynthesis, cholesterol biosynthesis, um, and even in synthesis of the receptors for the LDLs. So we recognize some things in there, but we need to learn some new things. Let's turn our attention to answering these questions like, what is transcription? So in order to understand transcription, let's look at a very cartoon-like structure of DNA. Remember the, um, the two strands of DNA travel anti-parallel to one another. So the five prime to three prime strand and the three prime to five prime strand. We give them some names that help us to orient geographically with it, with um, on a gene construct. We always call the top strand the coding strand um, or the plus strand. And we always call the bottom strand the minus strand or the template strand. That actually makes quite a lot of sense because when it comes to transcription, the bottom strand is the one that's going to be used as template to build the RNA. So said another way, transcription is the process of making RNA from a DNA code. Transcription, process of making RNA from a DNA code. So transcription always begins at a site that has been designated the plus one. There is no zero in a, in a sequence you know, of nucleotides. So we see that anything to the left of the plus one has a minus designation. So we have minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, as we crawl to the left there of this plus one start site of a gene. And then from as we crawl to the right, we get plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and so on as we count the nucleotides in that direction. We have another way of talking about this. We say that when you walk left, you're walking upstream. When you walk right, you're walking downstream. So we can move along a construct in either one of those two directions. Well, what is it that moves along that construct and, and makes RNA from DNA? Well, remember earlier in the semester, we actually talked about RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is famous because it is a great example of a, an enzyme that has many subunits. That is, it has significant quaternary structure. So this oligomeric enzyme in bacteria has two alpha subunits, a beta, a beta prime subunit, an omega, and a sigma. Remember, we're talking about the promiscuous sigma subunit. So this is a very oligomeric, very multimeric, uh, has a lot of quaternary structure enzyme. And it is what reads the template strand, in this case, the purple strand. And using the sequence of the purple strand, it builds the, the RNA from the DNA. So let's take a look then at a little more lingo regarding this process of transcription. 
we talked about the coding strand, the template strand, but notice then that the RNA as it's made in transcription is going to resemble the top strand because the base pairs will form between the newly forming RNA and the template strand or the bottom strand. So as those base pairs pair, just as the base pairs are pairing in the DNA, they, they, a G will pair with a C, a C will pair with a T, and so on forth. So the pairing, um, because of that base pair rules, will end up creating a strand that looks a lot like the top strand or the coding strand. But the major difference is remember that uracil is found in RNA versus thymine. So anywhere that you would see a T in the coding strand of DNA, you will see a U in the RNA. So we need to take on this term promoter though, and you might have been noticing that I have this sort of nebulous blue box to the left of the gene, or said the proper way, upstream of the gene, we see this blue box. Well, that quote blue box is a promoter. And as you probably guessed, it's not really a blue box. And the promoter is actually a set of particular sequences that serve as the initiation site where the RNA polymerase enzyme and all of its needed helpers will assemble. So we get um, all of those things, you know, landing on that promoter site. And in fact, um, the RNA polymerase and associated factors scan the um, DNA and look for promoter sequences. And they have much higher affinity for promoter sequences than they do to for the surrounding sequences. So when they reach a promoter, they're like, whoa, hello, good looking. And they, they pause and bind there and know that that's the site at which everything will begin. Um, in bacteria, sometimes we'll see a single promoter controlling multiple genes. So like gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four. Um, we say then that that's an operon and that the resulting RNA RNA that is formed is polycystronic, so like many genes on it. But in eukaryotes, we only see a single gene, um, monocystronic mRNAs being formed from it. So again, this promoter is not really a blue box, it's these consensus sequences. And depending on whether we're looking at bacteria or whether we're looking at humans, the promoter sequences are a little bit different. In bacteria, the sequences that designate a promoter and that RNA polymerase says, whoa, this is where I stop and this is where we get things started, um, those occur at negative 35 and at negative 10. And they are TT GACA and Tata at. Now, whether you're looking at a bacterium or whether you're looking at a eukaryotic organism, there's always a Tata box. So that Tata box recurs. In eukaryotes, we also see a cat box and a GC box. Um, so there's a little bit of variation across systems depending upon what organism you're looking at. One note is that promoters can be either strong or weak. So a promoter with a sequence that is exactly TT GACA and Tata AD in a bacterium will be transcribed very frequently because the promoter very closely resembles the ideal. But if you had something that was like a, A, G, A, C, A, and uh, A, T, T, A, A, T. That's a weaker promoter. It doesn't resemble the um, consensus sequences as strongly. And so it would be transcribed less frequently. So our goal now is to practice being RNA polymerase and see if we can transcribe um, a particular sequence, gene sequence within DNA and write the RNA. Let's try our ability to be good RNA polymerase enzymes. This is a gene construct that shows the plus one transcription start site. Remember, that's always where transcription will begin. It also shows some of the upstream sequences and in fact goes so far as to show the Tata box. Now this is a very strong, at least with respect to the Tata box, it's very strong in its resemblance to ideal. Um, we'd have to look at the minus 35 sequence to be fully sure of the strength of this promoter, but we're getting to see some of the promoter sequences here. So the way that RNA polymerase is going to work is that it's going to um, be scanning in a two-dimensional search along the DNA and it's going to come to this promoter sequence. It's going to slow, recognize that and be like, okay, this is where we get things kicked off. Um, and when it does so, what will happen is that it will denature a, sh a short region of the DNA. That means break the hydrogen bonds that hold together the base pairs.
So what has happened now is that the RNA polymerase enzyme, this kind of big red blob, and the promoter sequence have gone from being what is sometimes termed closed to being open. Um, and the resulting formation of a transcription bubble, this is literally often called a transcription bubble, has occurred. And it's the denaturation of approximately 18 base pairs of the DNA. So you'll notice that within that denatured re region is, of course, our plus one transcription start site. And we'll go ahead and label that so we're keeping track of it. So it's important to recall that in the RNA polymerase enzyme, the component of that RNA polymerase enzyme that really, really recognizes the promoter sequences is called the sigma subunit. So remember that sigma subunit is the promiscuous one that um, once it's done its job of recognizing the promoter is going to leave. It's going to actually get the heck out of there and go hang out with another RNA polymerase enzyme. So at this point now that, now that this uh, transcription bubble has, has formed, the template strand, the three prime to five prime strand, is now accessible for serving as the guiding code for the synthesis of the RNA. So we recognize that, of course, that's going to occur at the plus one transcription start site. So our RNA is going to start to get made. Um, and in fact, two nucleotides will literally diffuse in here and um, they will form the resulting um, phosphodiester bond um, between one another. It's a, a very... Um, it's a slow step compared to the remainder of the additions of the NTPs to, to build the RNA, but um, it does occur without any kind of outside assistance. So RNA polymerase can start its own um, beginning of the RNA synthesis without any help. So we know that it, just like the templates or just like the coding strand, this um, is going to be the five prime phosphate because it's anti-parallel to the the template strand which is which is traveling three prime to five prime so those two nucleotides will form their phosphodiester bond and then um, all in this process of initiation of, of RNA synthesis, of initiation of transcription, the RNA polymerase will move down a ways. And in fact, um, before the end of initiation, we will get the synthesis of 10 nucleotides within the RNA. So if we can kind of picture that taking place and the RNA polymerase heading down and reading that template strand, we would recognize that the G would then pair with a C, and the C with a G, and so on forth. So once the RNA polymerase then moves, eventually this um, five prime end of the RNA will just basically get kicked out as the DNA renatures. I'll do my best to draw that. So this ends then the initiation of transcription. You can see that the mRNA is beginning to get kicked out of the um, complex because the DNA is coming back together after RNA polymerase has moved down. Sometimes I think of RNA polymerase as being a bit like an iron, you know, as it passes through it, then cools and comes back together. And um, now we see that the first 10 nucleotides of RNA have been synthesized, and this is the end of initiation. And then the sigma subunit of the RNA polymerase actually leaves at this point. We call this clearing the promoter. And then the elongation can occur where the remainder of this gene is read and converted into RNA. So you can, you can try your hand at even longer gene sequences.